Hey guys, in a previous video I showed you that if we have a second order homogeneous differential equation like this, then x equals e to the lambda t is a solution to this equation if and only if lambda is equal to this. I've shown that in a previous video. Now, you may have guessed that this means there are two values of lambda, one of which is lambda 1, I'll call it lambda 1, which is minus zeta omega n plus omega n times the square root of zeta squared minus 1, and the other one corresponds to the other root, which is what I'll call lambda 2, which is minus zeta omega n minus omega n times the square root of zeta squared minus 1. Okay, so now what we've essentially shown is that x equals e to the lambda 1t is a solution. That's essentially what we've shown. And to really hammer down this point, let me write down what this actually means. It means that if I were to substitute x equals e to lambda 1t into this equation, then we would get zero. So let me write that down for you. That just means that lambda 1 squared e to the lambda 1t, I'm substituting into here now, plus 2 zeta omega n times lambda 1 e to the lambda 1t plus omega n squared, lam oh, not lambda, e to the lambda 1t is going to be equal to zero. That's because this is a solution to this. We can say the exact same for the other solution. We know that x equals e to the lambda 2t is a solution. And this means if we substitute x equals e to the lambda 2t into here, then it will be equal to zero. So let me do that for you right now. There we go, I've written them both out. Okay, now let me ask you an interesting question right now. Is is the equation x equals a e to the lambda 1t plus b e to the lambda 2t, where a and b are just constants, a solution? Is it a solution? I don't know. That's why I'm putting a question mark next to it. Is this a solution to this equation? x double dot plus 2 zeta omega n x dot plus omega n squared x double dot. Uh, sorry, just x equals to zero. Is this a solution to this? I don't know yet. Spoiler alert, it is, but we need to prove it formally. So in order to prove it formally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute this into here and show that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. So let me do that nice and slowly for you. Let me, let me substitute this into here. So the double derivative term will be equal to a times lambda 1 squared e to the lambda 1 t plus b lambda 2 squared e to the lambda 2t. Then we have to worry about this term just here, which is going to be equal to plus 2 zeta omega n times by, let's see, it'll be this term differentiated once, which will be a lambda 1 e to the lambda 1t plus b lambda 2 e to the lambda 2t, right? Now let's add this, now let's consider this term, which is going to be plus omega n squared times by just x, which is just this. So it's going to be a e to the lambda 1 t plus, plus b e to the lambda 2 t. Okay? Now if this, now if this is equal to zero, then we have essentially shown that this is a solution. And to do that, let me group all of these blue terms together and factorize out, and let me group all of these green terms together and factorize a b out. So this is what we get when we f group all the blue terms together and then factorize an a out, and this is what we get when we group all the blue green terms together and factorize a b out. Now it doesn't look like there's any easy way to show this is equal to zero, but we can by noticing that the terms inside this blue bracket is equal to this which I've written just above right here. So in fact we can say that this is equal to zero, and that's because we know this is a solution. Likewise, we know that this term just here, everything inside this green bracket, is equal to zero for the exact same reasons. This means that this entire term, this entire expression, is equal to a times by zero plus b times by zero, which, as you've probably guessed, is equal to zero, which is equal to your right-hand side of your equation. So we've shown that this, that this, is a solution to this. Left hand side equals to right hand side. So this means that this is a solution. X is equal to this beast is a solution. So let's replace this question mark 
with an exclamation mark. We've shown that it is a solution. Okay, now, as a, as a brief aside, we could have also done this by sh um, using something called the superposition theorem in mathematics, but I like to show things from scratch. Okay, now that we've got our very generalized expression here, let me just zoom out a little bit to make some space, and let me substitute the values of lambda 1 and lambda 2 into here so we can find out the actual equation of motion, the generalized equation of motion. Let me, let me paste lambda 1 and lambda 2 just here, just in their own separate world just around the corner. Okay, so let's substitute lambda 1 and lambda 2 into here. What we've essentially shown is x is equal to a e to the lambda 1 t Sorry, I forgot to substitute lambda 1. It's going to be equal to um, minus zeta omega n plus omega n times the square root of zeta squared minus 1. And now let's concern ourselves with this extra term on the side, plus b e to the power of, oops, don't forget there's also a t just here hanging around the side. There's a t times just there, plus b e to the power of this, which is going to be minus zeta omega n minus omega n times the square root of zeta squared minus 1, all times by t as well. Now we can simplify this out a little bit more too. Notice that both of these expressions have the same common term minus zeta omega n minus zeta omega n, so we can factorize that out. We can write this as e, sorry, x, x is going to be equal to um, e, let me write it in orange, e to the power of minus zeta omega n, all times by, all times by a, e to the omega n, times the square root of zeta squared minus 1 t, oops, there's a t out here too, there's a t out here too, plus b, e to the omega n, minus omega n, times the square root of zeta squared minus 1, all times by t. Okay, there we go, almost made a few careless errors, but there we go. This is your generalized equation of motion just here. And now, depending on whether um, zeta is less than 1, then this thing can be simplified further. So, so far we've shown that this equation right here is the generalized equation of motion, and it turns out that it's the unique equation as long as we're not dealing with values of zeta is equal to 1. And to prove that, um, you, I recommend you go to this link just here, which will show you all the information you need about uniqueness. Okay, so it basically, from here on, we can split our solution and simplify it further by noticing that when we deal with the underdamped case, so let's talk about the underdamped case, underdamped case, i.e. when zeta is less than 1, then we notice that this equation can be simplified down using something we called Euler's formula. So let's actually analyze this step by step. Let's evaluate e is equal to e, sorry, x is equal to e to the minus zeta omega n t times by this beast, a e to the omega n times by, now let's stop here. What happens if zeta is less than 1? That means whatever is in this square root sign must be negative, right? Hopefully, you can verify this with your calculator if you don't believe me. Just plug in a bunch of numbers if zeta is less than 1. And a way to get around this is to take a square root of, it's just take minus 1 outside of the square root sign. So let's write this as times the square root of minus 1 times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Notice what I've done here? I've taken out a minus 1 and rearranged these. And now, I'm going to add this other term and do the exact same thing. It's going to be b times e to the minus omega n times by the square root of minus 1 times by the square root of 1 minus zeta squared t. Okay, so as you probably guessed by now, this, the square root of minus 1 is just i, or, if, or it's called j, depending if you're an electrical engineer. And we can write this as x is equal to this expression just here. Now, at this point, I'm going to actually define everything you see here, this coefficient of ti and this coefficient of ti, as being um, a another term. So I'm going to define, partially for the reason of simplicity, I'm going to define this new term, which I will call omega d, as being omega n times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Notice that 
this will simplify out a whole lot. Now I'll be exploring why we call it omega d, and, and I'll be exploring omega n in a little bit more detail by the end of this video, but for now, let's just view this as purely a definition, I'll be going through the characteristics of this definition soon. So this will turn into x is equal to e to the minus zeta omega nt times by this expression just here. By the way, I should briefly aside to this, omega d stands for the damped natural frequency, but I'll explore more of the um, reasons for why we call it this shortly. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to recall a very interesting formula. I'm going to recall Euler's formula, which states that e to the power of i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. This is a very powerful formula, and I definitely won't be proving it in this particular video, but I'm going to be using it, noticing that this term and this term can be simplified individually. So let's, let's do that. Let's actually zoom out a little bit because I feel like it's getting a little bit clustered, and let's actually continue working on this. So x is going to be equal to, let's keep this going, e to the minus zeta omega nt times by this expression, which will boil down to a cosine omega dt plus i um, a uh, sine omega dt plus plus b cosine minus omega dt, notice there's a minus here, uh, plus i, so, I b i b sine um, omega minus omega d minus omega d t okay almost lost track almost lost track of what I was doing okay cool so this is this expression at the moment there seems no easy way to simplify it out but bear with me we'll see how we go let me scroll down to give a little bit of space okay so what we can do is we realize that the negative cosine is just equal to cosine so let me actually write this above I feel like this is turning into a useful sideline we can write we know that cosine of theta is actually equal to cosine of minus theta this is a trigonometric trigonometric identity so I won't be proving this video either and we know that sine of minus theta is actually equal to um, minus sine theta as well I'm gonna be using this but I definitely won't be proving in this particular video and as such we can actually rewrite this expression in a little bit more detail now we can rewrite this as x is equal to um, and it's going to be equal to this expression just here. Notice I've substituted out the sines and cosines and replaced them with the corresponding um, positive or negative coefficient. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can group the cosines and the sines together now that I've gotten rid of these pesky minus signs in there. So what's going to happen is I'm going to get x is going to be equal to e, let me use orange, it's going to be e to the minus zeta omega nt times by Let's see, if we group the cosines together, it will be omega dt times by, let's see, it'll be a just here, and we'll also have a b just there. It'll be plus b just here, plus b just here. All right, I'll be exploring how we can simplify this out shortly. And now let's group the, cosine, uh, the sines together. It'll be plus sine omega dt times by, let's see, what are the coefficients? It'll be a i just here, and it'll be minus minus bi just there, right? And uh, that's all under one bracket. In fact, let me use a different color bracket. There we go. Okay, now you may be thinking, well, what's the reason of this? I mean, I mean, we've got a, b here and i is here all over the place. Well, don't forget a and b, a and b are in fact just constants. And in fact, they could be complex constants as well. So it's actually in, it's, it, it's, it's convenient for us to rewrite both of these terms as just another constant, right? One constant plus another constant is just equal to another constant. So we can write this as x is equal to e to the minus zeta omega nt times by, times by what I will call c1 cos omega dt plus um, c2 sine omega dt. I know I haven't been sticking to my color coordination too much. I hope that doesn't bother you too much. Um, but so we've got a very simplified expression here now. And I could actually end at this. In fact, most um, uh, most math lectures end in this generalized expression. But it's convenient engineering to simplify this down a little bit further and rewrite this as just 
one sign. So we can write this as e to the minus zeta omega nt times by, and we could just, I'm going to use, a, I'll just call this some other constant, I'll call this, a, I'll just call it c, just another constant, times sine omega d t plus phi. You can prove that from trigonometry as well, and you can find c and phi by equating these two equations just here. And as a result, as a result, we've got our generalized equation of motion for underdamped motion. So we found our equation of motion in terms of what we've called our natural frequency and what we've called our damped natural frequency, but I haven't told you why we've decided to call them these things. I mean, you'd think they'd have a pretty important fun a purpose if, they've given su if they're given such names as natural frequencies and damped natural frequencies, right? And so the purpose of the end of this video is to really describe to you why we call them the names we do. So to do that, I want you to consider the case Consider the case where zeta, or our, damped ratio, our damping ratio, is actually equal to zero. Notice that it's still underdamped by definition because zeta is less than one is considered underdamped, which means then that this equation still applies. Don't forget that we also made the definition that omega d is equal to omega n times one minus zeta squared. Don't forget that we made that definition earlier. Right? So if we're dealing with the case where zeta is equal to zero, that means omega d, so omega d will actually equal to omega n in this case, right? Which means that our equation of motion will boil down nicely into, in fact, let me use orange. I want it to be a little bit more of a filling color. It'll be x is going to be equal to e to the minus uh, zeta omega n t um, times by c sine um, omega n t plus phi. And because zeta is equal to zero, that just means that this coefficient just here, this entire exponential will boil down to one, meaning we'll be dealing with c sine omega n t plus phi. So this is our equation of motion if zeta is equal to zero. And you can tell that if zeta is equal to zero, that that means our dampening constant c must also be equal to zero from a previous formula I, I showed in the first video. And so what we've essentially showed is that omega n is the frequency is the frequency of oscillation of oscillation in radians per second in radians per second um, if there was no dampening. That's what omega n is. So you can tell that this is the case, right? And, and, and this is why we call omega d the dampening um, natural frequency, because it's the frequency of oscillation when we do have dampening, when zeta is still less than zero, but not equal to, less than one, but not equal to zero, right? So you can tell that we've got two really crucial equations. This one is for when zeta is equal to zero, and this is for when zeta is just less than one, but not equal to zero. I hope that makes sense. Um, and uh, I think that finishes under damped motion.